If you uh, weren't here last week, we began a new series on the book of Galatians, and Pastor Lacey did a splendid job giving us an introduction and a history lesson too, right? It was awesome. Thank you, Pastor. I hope that, and we as pastors hope that you are uh, studying along with us at home, making uh, Galatians a part of your uh, daily devotions as we go through this series, which will uh, take us through the month of November. I want to begin by picking up where Pastor Lacey ended last week and do just a little bit of review. And uh, the verses that I'm going to be using today are mostly going to be from the NLT, New Living Translation. And so we're going to begin by reading the first part of Galatians chapter 1, if you want to join me there. And it's also going to be up on the screen here. Galatians chapter 1. This letter is from Paul, an apostle. I was not appointed by any group of people or any human authority, but by Jesus Christ Himself and by God the Father who raised Jesus from the dead. All the brothers and sisters here join me in sending this letter to the churches of Galatia. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Jesus gave His life for our sins just as God our Father planned in order to rescue us from this evil world in which we live. All glory to God forever and ever. Amen. Next verse. I am shocked that you are turning away so soon from God, who called you to Himself through the loving mercy of Christ. You are following a different way that pretends to be the good news, but it is not good news at all. You are being fooled by those who deliberately twist the truth concerning Christ. Let God's curse fall on anyone including us or even an angel from heaven who preaches a different kind of good news than the one we preach to you. I say it again, what we have said before, if anyone preaches any other good news than the one you welcome, let that person be cursed. Obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. And so, very simply here, Paul was uh, being accused of uh, many things, but holding back from preaching uh, circumcision or preaching the law or uh, you know uh, lowering the value of that. And but Paul has no interest in pleasing people, does he? And and he's pretty hardcore about it. I mean, you're, I'd like to have met this guy. Well, I will one of these days. But you know, uh, Jesus didn't expect everybody to approve of him, or you, or me. You know, in John chapter 15, verse 20, Jesus said, since they persecuted me, naturally they will persecute you. And if they had listened to me, they would listen to you. They will do all this to you because of me, for they have rejected the one who sent me. There's a lot to consider when we think about it that we don't have to have the approval of people as long as we have the approval of God. And I just love it that I mean, Paul just tells it like it is. I mean, he's, he's in your face. You know, he uses words like, I'm shocked, and you're being fooled, and those deliberately twisting the truth, and let God's curse fall on anyone who preaches a different kind of good news. And not man's curse, but he's saying, let God curse them. Ouch. Man, that's rough. Paul is defending the one true gospel here. Amen? And the word gospel simply means good news. And if you tell me that God will forgive all of my sins and account me as righteous, all I have to do is believe in Jesus, well, that's pretty good news. But if you tell me there's a lot of things I have to do, there's a lot of rules and regulations and things that I have to do in order to be accepted by God, well then, that's not really good news, is it? And so... Paul is writing to the Galatians here to correct them about some teaching that had followed his teaching from before and to free them from the bondage that they were getting back into of following the law. And so very simply, we, we come to God all on what He's done. Not on anything that we've done. We come to God on His grace. On His love. Not anything that I do. Not any works that I do. Because grace is the free gift of salvation. I appreciate what Pastor Lacey said last week that Paul would probably be really upset with 
uh, some of the things going on in churches here today, and I agree with that, and um, I think there's a lot of problems with things that are on the airways today, I mean, especially on TV and on YouTube. Uh, you can't believe everything that's out there. You need to weigh it against the Bible and what the Bible says, and does it line up to what the Bible says. Investigate for yourself the things that people are saying. And very simply, you know, if, it's, if the message is not that you need to be saved and the only way to be saved is through faith in Jesus Christ and His shed blood and death and resurrection, then it's a wrong message. Anything other than that is a wrong message and you need to be careful of it today. And I'll just tell you, um, I'm not gonna, I won't say any names here today, but if you want to ask me later on and say, what do you think about this person or that person, um, then I'll gladly tell you. Um, but I'll just give you a flip. You know, it's not the style of the person, although that is a factor. And I know style is important and we care about style and we like that person's style or whatever. But it's the content of the message. That's the important thing. You know, we just lost one of the greatest, greatest preachers, teachers out there, Dr. Charles Stanley. Now, I mean, that guy, that, that for me, just to give you an example, that's someone who's rock solid. You never heard anything bad about him. He never talked about any, anybody else. There was never, I don't think there's ever anything wacky uh, about what he taught from the pulpit. Now, people came down on him about his family and personal things in his family, and every, there's a lot of people that had opinions about that, even other churches and pastors, but that's somebody that was a rock solid. I mean, uh, you, you, you wouldn't second guess anything that he would share or write about. The message of Galatians is really uh, all you need is Jesus plus nothing. Jesus plus nothing. Uh, and that's the title of today's message, Jesus plus nothing. And so I want to read us something. It's not going to be on the screen, but I want to read us something. You can follow along or write it down, look it up later from Philippians tra chapter 3. And this is important because this is uh, Paul talking about Saul before he was Paul, before he was converted. And it talks about all the things he does, all his accomplishments. And then he, he has uh, some uh, comments about that. So I want to read that for us here before we move on. For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort. Jesus plus nothing. Though I could have confidence in my own effort, if anyone could, indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I am a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin. A real Hebrew if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest observance to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with Him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with Himself depends on faith. And again, that was from the New Living a Translation, NLT. But there's one verse in here from uh, the King James Version. And it reads this way. I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung. You all know what dung is? That would be one definition. It would be cow plop. And there's a whole lot of it behind the church here. I count them all but dung. That's what he said. This, I love this guy. That I may win Christ. And Paul is saying that all of his own righteousness, all those accomplishments that he had, all that knowledge that he had, and following all the laws and everything to a T, um, that it was worthless. You only become righteous through faith in Jesus. Jesus plus nothing. So, 
How did, how did Paul have his approval from God? Well, by doing what God called him to do. Next verse in Galatians 1, verse 11. Dear brothers and sisters, I want you to understand that the gospel message I preach is not based on mere human reasoning. I received my message from no human source, and no one taught me. Instead, I received it by direct revelation from Jesus Christ. Now, what about you and me and the average person today having the approval of God? Well, one way to address that is who do you long to please? Do you long to please God or do you care about pleasing men and how much? Whose approval matters the most? Proverbs 29 verse 25 says, The fear of man is a snare. And the word fear often means to reverence, to stand in awe of, or to worship. So seeking the approval of people is a form of idolatry. If, you're, if you want the approval of people, if you need the approval of people, you're worshiping the people. Well, to have the approval of God, uh, don't you have to do? You have to do some right things, don't you? To have the approval of God, you have to do some right things, don't you? Well, okay. What right things? And how many right things? And how do you know if you did enough right things? But, but wait a minute, there's going to be days where I don't get it right. Amen? Anybody honest? There's going to be days when I don't get it right. So then what about those days? Then, is God disappointed with me? Does God doesn't approve of me on those days? When I don't get it right? When I do all the right things? Well, but you can't do all the right things. You can't do everything perfect. There is a verse that has an answer to that question here, and it's from Romans 8, chapter 1 that says, So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. And if you are listening today, and the way that you were raised, or your family experiences, or your church experiences, and things like that, and you were taught to believe, or maybe even still believe today uh, in some measure, that there are certain things that you have to do and you have to follow certain rules or regulations, then you can be free of that today. Be free of that today. Now listen. Yes, we serve God. And yes, we're supposed to serve God. And yes, we're supposed to do good works. All of those things. Yes, very important. But we don't do it because we have to. We don't do it because we have a guilty conscience. We don't do it out of some compulsion or arm twisting. We do it out of the gratitude of our heart because all that God has done for us in Christ. You understand? So we, we, just, we want to do things, we, or we should. We should want to serve. We should want to be involved. Uh, we, but we're not serving because it's a requirement for salvation we serve and we do good works as a response out of the gratitude of our hearts. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus says, Come to Me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, plural, and I will give you rest. Take My yoke upon you. Let Me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Well now, that doesn't sound too difficult, does it? I mean, that doesn't sound like a lot of rules and regulations, right? I mean, words like rest, easy, and light, that's not a lot of hard work. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But now you know that Paul did not always have the approval of God, right? Before he was Paul, he was that other person. Uh, he, was, he was a terrorist. And next verse in Galatians uh, chapter 1 there. You know what I was like when I followed the Jewish religion, how I violently persecuted God's church. I did my best to destroy it. I was far ahead of my fellow Jews in my zeal for the traditions of my ancestors. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace to reveal His Son to me that I might preach Him among the Gentiles, 
Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. And so that verse sounds really reminiscent of another verse from the Old Testament in Psalms 139 that in part says, all the days for me God knew before there was one of them. See, God, God knows His plan for our life before we are even born. We are a unique person from conception. And that's one of the reasons that this church here is such a staunch supporter of women's comfort care because we believe that every life is precious and every life begins at conception. And God has a plan for every life. And, and when, when an abortion happens, then that, that plan for that person, that, that plan for that person is gone. And all the people that they would have touched in their lives and all the people, how God would have used their life, that's gone. But listen to what happens to Saul, the then Saul, when he meets Jesus. And I think it's important for us to hear this, and I'm not going to read the whole thing for you, but those of you who are taking notes, this is in, found in uh, Acts chapter 9. It says, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. And so he went to the high priest and he got letters and, and he was um, on the road to Damascus. Many times we call this the road to Damascus uh, experience or, or we'll say we're talking about a person you know, that we're praying for them will say that they need a road to Damascus kind of experience. No joke. They really need to meet Jesus in a powerful way. And so uh, Saul is on his way to arrest Christians. And it says, bring them back to Jerusalem in chains. And probably a lot of them are going to get killed. And he has this encounter with Jesus. And, and uh, Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Uh, now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. And so he goes into the city and uh, God sends uh, a gentleman named Ananias. And Ananias comes and reluctantly uh, prays for Saul because he, he lost his eyesight uh, during that encounter. And Ananias prays for him. He gets his sight back. He gets filled with the Holy Spirit. And he gets baptized. And so... Saul, he has an encounter with Jesus and he is radically changed. And that's what happens, folks. That's what Jesus does to you. Just Jesus. When you, when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, He changes you. You are not the same anymore. Or you shouldn't be the same anymore. A whole lot of things, a whole lot of things are supposed to die in your life. You are a new person. And you could even be like Saul. I mean, the guy was a terrorist. That's what he was. He's killing people. <laughs> and now he goes from being zealous to get rid of Christians to now he's all in uh, supporting the cause that he used to try to get rid of. Well, we need to move on. So the rest of, uh, we're going to finish up chapter 1 here, but the rest of chapter 1, Paul does a lot of traveling back and forth, actually several years of traveling. And then it says, um, down verse 22, the Christians in the churches in Judea didn't know me personally. All they knew was that people were saying, the one who used to persecute us is now preaching the very faith he tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. And just by the way, um, I think the first recorded place where Saul is now referred to as Paul is Acts uh, chapter 13. But Paul, Paul has his credibility proven in two ways. He, he, he gets this calling from God. God called him. And he has this encounter with Jesus, and his life is radically changed. And you know something? We all have that, in a sense. You have, you have God's calling on your life, how, how God was working in your heart, and the Holy Spirit was speaking to you, and the Holy Spirit was drawing to you, and, or the Holy Spirit was bringing conviction on your heart because you were running from God, or the way that you were living your life before you came to Christ, and God was calling you and drawing you to Him, or, or was drawing you to, that you needed to go to church, or... Or maybe the Holy Spirit was just drawing you that you needed to surrender right in your living room and cry out to God and surrender. Um, but then you have your story, your testimony of how your life has been changed since Jesus. You get that? You have your own story. And so, you need to share your story. Amen. Well, we're going to move on to Galatians chapter 2.
So if you want to follow along with me there, again, this will be on the screen. Here we go. Then 14 years later, I went back to Jerusalem again, this time with Barnabas, and Titus came along too. I went there because God revealed to me that I should go. While I was there, I met privately with those considered to be leaders of the church and shared with them the message I had been preaching to the Gentiles. I wanted to make sure that they were in agreement for fear that my efforts had been wasted and I was running the race for nothing. So, what he's saying here is he really he didn't go and like preach and have a church service. He was going and talking with the leaders there in Jerusalem. And the reason was that there, there would have been a lot of former uh, Pharisees there. There would have been a lot of Jews there still uh, that were still pretty firm about the importance of the law and circumcision. And so, really in essence, what was going on, there was a problem with the leaders. And so he needed to meet with the leaders and see... Uh, where people were at and, well, straighten them out. And so Paul, Paul had this, uh, this meeting in private with the apostles there in Jerusalem. And it says, so after however much all that discussion was, and they supported me and did not even demand that my companion Titus be circumcised, though he was a Gentile. Even that question came up only because of some so-called Christians there, false ones really, who were secretly brought in. They sneaked in to spy on us and take away the freedom we have in Christ Jesus. They wanted to enslave us and force us to follow their Jewish regulations. So, evidently, there was at least some amount of discussion here, but I think even um, there was probably some argument on this issue here uh, with Titus and had he been circumcised or not and did he need to be and was he going to be accepted if not. But, But Paul says... We refused to give in to them for a single moment. We wanted to preserve the truth of the gospel message for you. You know, there's the truth of the gospel message. It's, as I've already said, the title of today's message, Jesus plus nothing. There's a story in uh, Acts chapter 16. Paul and his ministry partner, uh, Silas, they get thrown into jail for preaching the gospel. And they're in jail, and the best way to deal with it was they were praying and they were worshiping, and God causes there to be an earthquake there at that jail, and the, the doors fly open on the, on the jail, and the, the jailer, it would have been the guy in charge or commander there, but the jailer feared for his life because if the prisoners escaped, then he would be executed for uh, bad judgment. And so the jailer pulls his sword. He's going to kill himself. And Paul says, no, don't do it. And the jailer says, what must I do to be saved? And Paul's answer is, believe in Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. In the worst of what could be the worst of circumstances. I mean, this guy's getting ready to kill himself. What must I do to be saved? Believe in Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. That's it. John 3.16, we, we know it well or should. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And how do you believe in Him? How do you get to that place? One answer is in uh, Romans 10.9 that says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus plus nothing. Nothing else added to that. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God and it is by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. Jesus plus nothing. Next verse. And the leaders of the church had nothing to add to what I was preaching. And, and here again, Paul just getting <laughs> giving some attitude. By the way, their reputation as great leaders made no difference to me, for God has no favorites. Instead, they saw that God had given me the responsibility of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, just as he had given Peter the responsibility of preaching to the Jews. For the same God who worked through Peter as the apostle to the Jews also worked through me as an apostle to the Gentiles. In fact, James, Peter, and John, who were known as pillars of the church, recognized the gift God had given me. 
and they accepted Barnabas and me as their co-workers. They encouraged us to keep preaching to the Gentiles while they continued their work with the Jews. Their only suggestion was that we keep on helping the poor, which I have always been eager to do. But when Peter came to Antioch, I had to oppose him to his face for what he did was very wrong. When he first arrived, he ate with the Gentile Christians who were not circumcised. But afterward, when some friends of James came, Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. He was afraid of criticism from these people who insisted on the necessity of circumcision. So right here, what Peter was doing is, well, certainly bad judgment, but Peter's, he's sending a mixed message. You know, he's over here hanging out with the Jews. Well, that makes people think, hey, well, there must be something wrong with these guys over here that he doesn't want to sit with them. Maybe it's because they aren't following all the laws or doing all the right things or this group over here hadn't been circumcised yet. As a result, other Jewish Christians followed Peter's hypocrisy and even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. When I saw that they were not following the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of all the others, since you, a Jew by birth, have discarded the Jewish laws and are living like a Gentile, why are you now trying to make these Gentiles follow the Jewish traditions? You and I are Jews by birth, not sinners like the Gentiles. Yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law. And we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we might be made right with God because of our faith in Christ. Not because we have obeyed the law. For no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law. And so here in this translation, when it says made right, in some of your Bibles, if you have a NIV or King James Version, in place of made right, it's going to use the word justified. And so we, we, we understand justified. If, you, if you've ever been to court for anything or know anybody that has been, or you, there's a crime, you go to court, the case is presented, uh, there may be a jury, and the judge renders a verdict, and there's a sentence. So, uh, you know, a crime has happened, there's been a sentence, and then someone's going to have to, you know, fulfill that sentence or, you know, pay that fine or whatever it is. So, justice has been served. So we've, we've seen in the news over the last few years, you've seen riots and things like that about situations and people be, you know, holding up a sign and the sign says, we want justice. And what they mean is, well, they want someone to pay. They want someone to pay. They want someone to, to go to jail for what has happened. And so here in this context right here, we are made right. We are justified. The penalty that we owe is paid simply by believing in Jesus. Does that make sense? So Paul is saying even those who have kept the law still can only be justified through faith. Not by the works. No one can be justified by the works of the law. Even if you could keep all the laws, it would still not save you. Next verse. But suppose we seek to be made right with God through faith in Christ, and then we are found guilty because we have abandoned the law. Would that mean Christ has led us into sin? Absolutely not. Rather, I am a sinner if I rebuild the old system of law I already tore down. For when I tried to keep the law, it condemned me. So I died to the law. I stopped trying to meet all its requirements so that I might live for God. Excuse me. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. What a wonderful day when we come to Christ and, and that old person is crucified. Do you all remember that day? Remember that day when you came to Christ? When you surrendered to Him? What a wonderful day. No longer is my life about me. No longer is my life centered around me and what I want. Now my life is centered around what God wants. I want to please Him with my life. Jesus is on the throne of my life. 
from then on. No longer pleasing myself. I'm not the, I'm not the old man or woman I used to be. That old man or woman died. That person died. That person was crucified with Christ. I have a new life now. Next verse, I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless, for if keeping the law could make us right with God, then there was no need for Christ to die. And so, listen, when Jesus was was in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before He was crucified, And this verse is from Matthew chapter 26. But he knelt and he prayed and he said, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. And what is he talking about? If it is possible. I mean, if, well, if there was any other way possible, if there's any other plan that his Father could have, any other way of accomplishing this, any other way, for man to be saved. Any other way to pay for the sins of man. And the cross of Jesus declares to all people from all times that there is only one way to be saved and there's only one man that could do it and that's Jesus Christ Himself. And so, certainly, if there was a possibility of another plan, God would have had one. I mean, if there was any other way, then God would have said, yes, son, you know, okay, well, we'll do it this way. But there was no other way. And in part, I think because God is so, so holy and sin is so, so awful and ugly, abhorrent to God, that the punishment for sin has to be awful. There's no other way. And so, man can't do it. And rules and regulations can't do it. The only way it could be done was through Jesus, the God-man. Fully God, fully man. He had to be man so He could die for man's sins, but He had to be God so He could forgive us and raise from the dead. And see, so, look at the cross. So we just read, I am crucified with Christ. So, well, how does that mean? What that very simply means, when I come to Jesus, when... When I, when I surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, let me just put it that way. I don't know, and I'm sorry I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings here, but I don't know just simply if all you've ever done in your life and your relationship with Jesus is, well, I gave Him my heart at such and such a time. But I think there needs to be a time in your life, wherever that happened, that could be in church service, that could be in your home, that could be in your car, that could be out in the park, but wherever you are, that you realize that your life was not surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, and that's what you needed to do. I am crucified with Christ. The, the old me is dead. The old me is dead. I don't do the things that I used to do. I don't talk the way I used to talk. I don't act the way I used to. I still look the same. I look like that same person. My voice probably sounds like that same, but I don't, I don't go hang out with the same people that I used to hang out with. Um, you know, I don't have the same values that I used to have. I don't read the same things I used to read. I don't watch the same things. All of that died. Do you understand? All of that should have died because I'm crucified with Christ. But maybe as you sit here today, Is there anything lingering in your life that the Holy Spirit would say right now, well, maybe there's something there in your life for whatever the reasons are that never really got uh, completely crucified? Uh, In fact, I'm just going to pray right now. Lord, Father, I just pray right now by the power of the Holy Spirit that You would speak to hearts here right now, God. What are the things in our lives, God? What are the things that maybe... Um, never got crucified in our life, God? What are the things that maybe uh, we've allowed something to creep back into our life, God, that is not acceptable to You, God? What are those things? By the power of the Holy Spirit, show us right now. Speak to every single person here, God. Is there anything in our life, God, that is not acceptable to You? And today, that we would say, that thing is dead in me today. 
that I'm drawing a line in the sand today. That thing is dead in me today. That has no control over me today. That thing is gone. That's not going to be a part of my life anymore in Jesus' name. And so we're crucified with Christ. And this, this language, crucified with Christ, you can also find similar language in Romans chapter 6. But also in Romans chapter 6, it talks about baptism. And if you don't know that we really feel strongly about baptism here in this church, and if you haven't been baptized, or maybe you got baptized a long time ago and you didn't understand it, didn't mean as much as it does to you now, or you've rededicated your life to the Lord. But baptism is a huge part of this because Jesus didn't stay on the cross, right? I mean, we know He raised from the dead, but, but between the cross and there, what happened? He got put in the ground. He got put in the tomb. And so when you get baptized, you're, you're not only identifying with His death, old me is dead, but you're identifying with His burial. Old me is buried. Old me is not coming back. Praise God. Old me is gone. Old me is a thing of the past. I don't even know that person anymore. Do you feel like that? Sometimes you think about, some of you that are older like me, but you think about, that, that person you used to be before Christ. And I mean, it doesn't even seem like. I mean, I think about it, I'm like, I mean, was that really me? I mean, no, that wasn't even me. I mean, was, was I that person? Did I do those kind of things before? I mean, it's hard to believe that was really me. I used to be, <laughs> used to be that bad. Yes, I was. And so we, we identify with Christ's death. Old me crucified. We identify with his burial. Old me is gone, buried, not coming back. But then when we come up out of the water from getting baptized, now we're identifying with his resurrection. New me lives by the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. And the Holy Spirit gives us a power to live a life that honors God and is pleasing to him. And that life, I'll just read us something here. Uh, I just thought about this this morning. This is uh, from 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 2. You know, the, I think we could say uh, the title of today's message, Jesus plus nothing, and then I think we could put underneath of that, what I believe needs to be evident in how I behave. What I believe needs to be evident in how I behave. And so, we, we should be noticeably different to our friends, our co-workers, or, you know, uh, there should just be something noticeably different about us. It doesn't mean we're beating people over the head of the Bible. Listen to this right here. This is from 2 Corinthians. But thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession, and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of Him everywhere. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. So, you know, we don't really smell, but there should be aroma about it. There should be something that's attractive about us. People should notice that there's something different about us because what I believe needs to be evident in how I behave. And so today, um, if you have never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, then I hope you will do that today. Or if you've wandered from Him and you made that commitment a long time ago, I hope that today that you will surrender. I mean truly surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And as I was, um, as I was preparing for this message, and I was uh, some, doing some of my preparation driving down the road to Tennessee to our staff retreat a couple weeks ago. And I was asking the Lord, well, is there, you know, Lord, is there something that you want me to include in the message today? What's it going to be? Help me with this sermon. And almost immediately, the Lord put something on my heart that I needed to share. And I knew that it was probably right because I'm like, well, Lord, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> and... And just I'll give you just a short story here. Uh, worship team, why don't you come on up on the stage, please? Short story, I, I surrendered to Christ. Now, I gave my heart 
to Jesus when I was a teenager. But I surrendered to Christ in summer of 1984. And when I mean surrender, it was on my knees, literally crying out to God. And I, and I actually remember, I wish I, you know, I wish I, the, there was a recording of it or something, you know. But one thing I do remember about that day, I said, God, I hate my life. I hate my life the way it be has become. I hate who I am right now. God, if you will make something out of my life, here it is. Change my life. And it, it was literally on my knees and literally crying out to God. That was summer of 1984. And fast forward the story. 1999. We've been members of Cornerstone Church at this point almost six years. We're in life group. I'm leading worship. Well, I'm one of two people leading worship at that point in time. Should be pretty mature in my Christian faith at that point in time, don't you think? And now, I'm, next part I'm going to share here, I'm going to do a disclaimer here, because some of you, I'm going I'm to start meddling here in a minute. But, listen to a disclaimer here. This is David's story. This is not your story. Your story may be different depending on how God works in your life by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is my story. At this point in time in my life, um, I would have a couple drinks and not think anything about it. Have a couple beers and not think anything of it. And if you can have a beer once in a while and you're okay with it, it doesn't bother you, and you never have another one for a while, okay, great, praise the Lord. But for me, it had become a habit, you see? And I'd even excused it as, oh, I, mean, I don't get drunk, you know, I mean, that's, I don't do that anymore, I mean, you know. And I gave that up a long time ago. And... I was at a business meeting in March of 1999, and it was in New Jersey, and I, I remember what it was about. It was about embracing the emerging internet to grow your business. Well, that's what it was. It was about, you need, you need to get on the internet, you know, you need to buy in. Uh, Pastor knows, yeah, I can remember stuff like that. Went out, went to a nice restaurant that night, had my customary couple drinks, I didn't, didn't get drunk. I didn't go to a party. Had me a couple drinks. Okay, because that's what I did. I get back to my hotel room, and almost immediately, I sense the Lord say, just as much as if it had been audible, you have to have it, don't you? Not, not a whole lot of discussion. Well, David, you shouldn't do that. David, you should know better. I wish you wouldn't do that. You have to have it. It was, a, it was an evaluation of my life by the Lord Himself. And that's, that's who I was. I had to have it. I couldn't have a glass of wine on a rare occasion, or I had to have it. And, you know, and I'd fooled myself to the point that, you know, if I'd mow grass, I'd go to the little store down the street from our house when we lived across the mountain and finish mowing grass on a hot summer day. Well, that's an excuse to get a couple of beers. But some days I'd say, you know, I'm going to be good today. I'm only going to get one. So you get a 20 ounce. I mean, yeah, I repented right in that hotel room, right there that night. And my story, yours may be vastly different. There's a lot of things about your life today, folks, that other than, you know, alcohol consumption or not, a lot of other issues we could be, we could be talking about today. What would the Lord say to you today that, and assess your life and say, you're an angry person, that's who you are. You're an unforgiving person, that's who you are. You're a negative person, that's who you are. How about in a room this size, I'm sorry people, but there's going to be at least a couple of people in here right now that are struggling with pornography and the Lord would say, you're, you're doing it. Yes, it is an addiction. There's an addiction going on in your mind, but you're doing it. You're doing it, and that's who you are. Folks, what do you need to get free of today? And what I want to ask us to do today, we're going to have a time of ministry here, and there's plenty of room for you to get down between these chairs and tables just as much as there would be if we had rows. But I want to have a time of ministry here this morning. And whatever that thing is, whatever the Lord would speak to you, maybe it's something totally different from anything I said today, but maybe the Lord is just putting something on your heart right now. There's something in your life that you need to say 
that thing is crucified in me, that thing is dead and buried in me after today. That thing is dead in me. And then let someone pray for you and minister to you. Why? Because the Bible says in the book of James chapter 5, if we confess our sins one to another, He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And that person can pray with you and agree with you. You don't have to give them all the gory details, but you can just say, brother or sister, I've, I've realized today that I've got an anger issue and I just want to declare today that anger is dead in my life. And that brother or sister can pray with you and say, in Jesus' name, anger is gone in your life and be free. So, would you please stand and...